It doesn't take much to fly. Wings and wind. But to truly soar, that takes a flock. Delta Secret Sauce for sure is its people. It's our company. Ed runs it, but it's still our company. Soaring above and beyond the turbulence. We were two weeks away from not being able to pay our people. The leaders were confident enough to say, we need your help. Lifting each other to new heights. Delta is not for sale. We climb. We can come together and be amazing. We climb. It's more about the people than the dollars. Always looking to be better. We keep climbing. All right. Good morning, South by Southwest. It is so nice to be with all of you today. Can I just start with a show of hands? How many of you flew Delta here? There we go. OK, Ed, you've got a lot of customers here. Absolutely. It's great to be here, Allison. And Allison is the editor-in-chief of Fortune magazine. So yes, he, let's, say, let's give it up to Allison as well. And thank you, Peter, thank for you. those opening remarks. Thank you. Um, so Ed, I want everybody to get to know you a little bit. Um, you were the oldest of nine children. Yeah. You grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, yeah. and you never stepped foot on an airplane until you were 25 years old. Yeah. People ask me how I ever got this job. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Do your siblings feel like they trained you for this role? What sort of values did you get growing up that you apply to today in your leadership? Well, I, I don't want to sound like a dinosaur, because it sounds like a dinosaur. I'm from the cave, caveman era, almost never having been on an airplane. But growing up back then, uh, it was, life was simpler. You know, and being one of nine kids is not the norm today. Certainly, it was a little more easier to manage. But certainly, you learned lessons about leadership, about accountability, about showing up on time for dinner or else you didn't get food. <laughs> or you know, your chores in, in the, the responsibilities you took. And it also inspired me to get the heck out of the house as quick as I could. So I left when I was 18, went to college, and never came back. But I, I love my family, and we're all still close to this day. Amazing. And you don't have nine children. I do not have nine children. <laughs> That's the one thing I said. I will not have nine children. <laughs> Amazing. So you've had a long career at Delta. You were an accountant before that. You were at Pepsi before that. Um, but since 1998, you've really been with Delta. Um, so you've been there for over 25 years, but there was a little blip. There was six months where you were not there, um, and the airline was going through quite a bit. Um, and you returned six months later at a huge salary cut. I was told maybe half your salary. Mm -hmm. um, what happened at that period? Why did you leave and come back? Well, the airline industry is a great industry, but it's also a tumultuous industry, as a number of our industries are. And following 9-11, there was traumatic impact across our industry, and all of the airlines were in pretty bad shape because travel was changed forever, and people candidly didn't know travel, particularly internationally, was ever going to come back. And the company was going through making a lot of adjustments, pay cuts, job losses, you know, reductions in service, customers were feeling the pain, employees were feeling the pain, and I was there at the time, and I wasn't in the leadership role that I am today, but I was there and I was a voice that I thought we were going about it a little bit counter to the values that we established for our nearly 100 year history, and that's putting people first. And people seem to be last in that environment, and it got some point, you know, you, you, you go through and you can't have your voice heard, Sometime your feet have to do the talking. And fortunately, six months later, the company reached out to me and said, you're right, would you please come back to, to help lead the restructuring, help lead the company's resurgence? And it was the best choice I ever made. It was the best pay cut I ever took. Wow. So sometimes you need to take a, a haircut, I guess, to uh, accelerate and accelerate your company. Well, the, the absence of your voice sometimes speaks louder than your voice in a crisis. Yeah, voting with your feet. Um, so how did you bring, how did you help Delta come back from the brink of, it was bankrupt. In 2005, you and other airlines filed for bankruptcy. You rejoined as the CFO, tasked with a major restructuring of the company. Um, you had to cut jobs, do all sorts of things. How did, what are the steps you took? Now Delta's the largest airline by revenue. What steps did you take? In that it's not just the largest, it's the best too. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I have, um, I have a lot of great leaders, uh, Tim Mapes, Alicia, Betsy. We're, we're, we're a company of people. And while the CEO tends to get outsized attention, it's really the leadership team 
that resurrected the turnaround of our company. Many of us collectively were there then and we're still, we're still running uh, the company today. But there were a couple things. First of all, we needed a business plan that worked and we understood that through a restructuring, you can actually make some real changes that otherwise you couldn't have made in normal times. And so we were pretty bold and aggressive about changing a few things about how we flew and where we flew and what our network consisted of. But most importantly, we let our people know that they were not the reason that the company was failing. It's so common today and throughout my 45 year history, uh, professional history, for people in times of crisis to feel like it was somehow their fault. You know, they're, too, they're paid too much, they're not as productive as they need to be, the competition's doing better, they're not innovative, they're not fast enough. That's management's responsibility to make those decisions and to set the path, not the employees. The employees bear the brunt of that. So the single most important thing we did, Allison, is we started to gather our people together in groups of two to 300 at a time. And we, we would do these sessions that we called Velvet, which today, almost 20 years later, we still do. I'm speaking one in Orlando Friday of this week. And we bring now, they're larger, there are seven, 800 frontline employees from all over the com company. And we talk about the business. We talk about their role in the business. We have some fun, we celebrate the success. And we talk about where we're going. And we cast vision together. And over time, if you do that over 20 years, that culture is palpable. You know, people talk about culture all the time and they wonder what culture means. And, Culture seems like it's the soft stuff, it's the nice stuff, it's, no, it's the hard stuff. Culture is the fabric of your company. It's the fabric of your values. Your values are input into your culture. We invested into the culture of our people and we actually unleashed them to go do their very best to take care of customers and that we would take care of the business and together, you know, we've never looked back and we continue to, to fly to new heights and certainly how we got through the pandemic of all things. So it sounds like you know, people are at the core of your culture. Um, in 2007, I believe maybe even a little bit earlier, you started doing a profit share with employees. Yeah. Can you explain how that came out of um, the bankruptcy and the yeah. turnaround and what it, you just gave $1.4 billion back to your employees this yeah. Valentine's Day? Yeah, so back then we were going through some real difficult uh, pay cuts, as I mentioned, some job losses. We needed to get smaller in order to get bigger eventually and to restore our, our status and our scale. And the thing I promised our people was that when we did turn profitable, that they would get the first rewards, the first fruits of their sacrifices. And effectively, our people get, our frontline, not management, our frontline people get 15% of the profits of the company. They get paid before management. And by the way, if we're not paying profit sharing in a year, management doesn't get bonuses either, which is the way it ought to be. And so oftentimes, you know, the company's not doing well, you see this management still taking these outside, no, no. It starts with people first. And back then when you're losing money, they kind of looked at that and said, okay, well, that's nice, but I'm not sure what I can take to the bank. And in 2007, we had the first payment, and it was about 100 or $200 million of, I forget what the exact number was, but it's grown over time. Uh, we always pay it out on Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is the best day to fly Delta. Everyone's happy. Everyone is having a party. We celebrate it loudly. Uh, we even had, I was on, we had Ludacris come to the Atlanta uh, on the ramp. We, I brought him on the ramp and he and I, we did uh, a little thing together and he, he gave a concert right on the live ramp. Their planes are going by and, you know, other airlines are coming over, you know, wondering what's going on over here at Delta. And it was, it was cool because you want to celebrate that success loudly. But yes, we distributed $1.4 billion, that's with a B. And over the last decade, we've distributed over $11 billion to our people. It's the most widely <laughs> distributed profit sharing arrangement in, in the country. I know of no other one that's had that level of return. And it's the best money we spend because our employees are always asking, how do we improve profit sharing for next year? I want even, even a bigger opportunity because this year it was about 10% of the pay. And I said, the best thing we can do is continue to do our jobs better and serve customers more and take greater share and head on, we go. Amazing. So You've seen your fair share of turbulence at Delta. We saw in the video that at one point, um, actually at the bankruptcy point, you were within two weeks of not being able to pay people. Um, so you went through 9-11, you went through the bankruptcy and the turnaround, um, but all of that paled in comparison, I think you would say, to COVID and that hitting. You became CEO in 2016, so you had a few years of 
glory before the pandemic, and then the pandemic happened, and you've said, oh, I was depressed. All of this progress we've made to turn this airline around to get back on top, gone overnight. How did you, sometimes leaders don't feel like leading. How did you pick yourself out of that depression and really um, turn your attitude around for your people? Yeah, that was, uh, that was hard. That was really, really hard because we had just finished 2019 was our best year ever, best year ever in the history of global aviation, Delta, best revenues, best performance, best profit, 1.6 billion in profit sharing that year. So, and it was, it was pay down Valentine's Day of 2020 and literally two weeks later, the world shut down. And we went not just from shutdown, we went from a best year ever to nobody flying. And that going on for month after month after month. We, we now look back on COVID because we know the end of the story. And we say that was really hard. But back, put yourselves back three years ago, four years ago. We didn't know if there was going to be a vaccine, much less when there was going to be a vaccine, how effective it would be. This was a global issue. That we were, we were, and we thought our lives were forever, not never going to return to what we had, and so uh, as a leader, yes, I was, I was pretty, pretty distraught. I, uh, uh, on a personal note, I lost my mom too, who was my personal hero. She was my mentor, and she raised all nine of us. And she was, I think, one of the early COVID deaths. She died at the end of February, uh, right as we we're starting to go into shutdown. And so I was, I lost my mom. I lost my business. I thought I was Job in the Bible, you know, kind of what's coming next. And, uh, and I, I allowed myself, because I think it's important to allow ourselves to be honest with ourselves and to grieve a little bit and to, to acknowledge, you know, the pain that we were going through. But I also, you know, realized how important it was to lead, to get back up again. And so I gave myself a couple of weeks and uh, started to realize that this was not the time to feel sorry for myself or anyone, this is the time to lead. This was actually the most important time to lead in history for our company and candidly for our world because our world needed to know who to follow, who to trust, where to go for information and leadership. And I, and this maybe is a little bit of a mind game, I don't know, but I, I appreciated that it was, a, it was a privilege to lead. It was not a burden, it was a blessing to be in that seat in our 100-year history, never a more important time. And that gave me the strength every single morning to get up and to go lead and put that brave face on and provide that confidence and that spark and that motivation and never stopped. And it was hard. You know, you know, there were times that you didn't feel like it, but that's what leaders do, is that you have an unrelenting commitment to succeed. You realize it's going to be hard. You don't sugarcoat it. You realize the significance of what you're going through but you never doubt that you're gonna get there. No one ever doubted. And then when they'd ask me why, why, I, why I believed, I believed because of the power of what we get to do is to connect the spirit and connect people together. And we saw how isolated the world was during COVID and how hard life seemed and how what's where fear and anxiety and, and depression sat. We're a force for good in this world. And our business model is to bring the world together not to separate, and the world needed to be together. So that's why I knew we were going to get there, and people just started following. Mm -hmm. So I, I, a lot of the employees during COVID naturally turned over. Um, 20,000, so about a quarter to, uh, to a fifth of your workforce turned over. We brought in 25,000 new people in that time. Um, but you didn't lay people off. I think you did other we things. We did not lay one person off throughout the entire pandemic, which was amazing. I think that was our biggest, our biggest statement of who we are. Wow. Um, so how did those 20,000 people transition out, if not layoffs, and then how do you recruit 25,000 people in a short period of time and maintain the culture that you've worked right. so hard? So we, we have an employee base of about 100,000 people. And right when the pandemic hit the first few weeks, one of the outreaches I made to our people was that we needed people to take time off. Uh, we uh, had just finished Valentine's Day, the profit sharing payment the, the week before, or the month before, it was 17% at that point in time of pay. So I knew people had some money. You know, you talk about paying it forward. I asked our people to pay it forward for, to take the take off time to allow those people who couldn't afford to take off time to keep their jobs. And our people responded. You talk about culture and spirit showing up. We had 50,000 people take up to two years off without pay. We certainly kept their benefits intact and we gave them travel 
privileges. Best time to travel ever, by the way, guys. If you weren't traveling, you missed it. Uh, everyone wants to know what private travel is? Well, that was private travel. <laughs> and we, we wound up shrinking our company in half overnight, overnight, which in a, hard, a big fixed cost business, which was really, really hard to do. And then we also offered inducements for retirements. We had about 20,000 people agree to take an early retirement, again, to hold the jobs of a younger person who couldn't afford. So we went down to like 30,000 people quickly, which is unheard of. And then we started to bring people back, and those people that took that time off without pay have returned. The people that, that uh, we've needed to hire, about one in three people now today at Delta are new over the course of the last few years. And so we're continuing to bring them in and we're back delivering the quality of experience and, and reliability that we're known for. Uh, the last six months, Delta has been an amazing uh, airline to fly and uh, we, we continue to, to be a better airline for the experience, not worse. Another thing you did during the pandemic and some of it is still intact, um, you made some decisions that hurt revenue short term uh, with the hope that it would be long-term beneficial. So there were no middle seats sold for a chunk of the pandemic. Yep. They're now back, darn. Um, <laughs> they came back. Um, and there's no more change fees, which uh, you were generating about a billion dollars a year from change fees. So talk me through how you weigh the short-term costs that are significant in the hope that it'll be long-term beneficial. Yeah. Well, one of the things during the pandemic uh, we needed to inspire confidence in returning to travel. And you know, with all the uncertainty out there, change fees actually were a deterrent because you wanted people to go, but, well, I don't know what the health protocol is going to be there. I don't know if I'm going to get sick. I don't know if the reason I'm going is actually going to be able to be executed. And then I don't have to pay a penalty if I have to change. So we said, let's get rid of these change. By the way, we wanted to get rid of change fees for years. It gave us the perfect opportunity to get rid of this so, so that people can travel without a punitive tax on them in case they, they needed a change. And, and it's actually inspired even more travel as a result, because people feel free to this day to book their, book their plans without fear of loss. The other thing, though, on the middle seat, uh, we did block the middle seat throughout the course of almost the entire pandemic. Uh, it was almost two years that we blocked those middle seats. And, um, you know, we're, we, we had a lot of debates internally as to whether we should do it. I had my revenue team you know, hating me for a while. They said, come on, you know, it's, you know the, the, we, need, we need to sell these seats. We have no revenue coming in. And we would, we would constantly continue to extend that and extend that and extend that. And they kept asking me, when was it gonna be okay to sell the middle seat? I said, our customers will tell us when it's okay, when they feel confident. And the confidence came when people, the majority of the people were vaccinated, people started to feel the demand set required it, and then we started selling them almost two years later. I still have people to this day stop me when, when I'm flying and they'll thank me for that because the people that were traveling back then were not people that necessarily wanted to travel. They're people that had to travel, people that had to get to the bedside of a loved one or they had a, a work emergency or a supply chain issue or a, they were a frontline hero uh, going out and saving, saving a community. Uh, those are the people that really, really do desperately appreciated that policy. And we became known as the airline of choice the airline of wellness during COVID. If you were gonna travel, this was the only airline that you should be traveling on was Delta and that became, enhanced our brand reputation and, and the impact. And we wound up, believe it or not, when you do the right thing, it often turns to be the smart thing. We actually had more revenue on our planes, like for like, compared to our competitors' planes who were selling out their planes. We were only selling two thirds of our planes, but generating more revenue than those that were selling all of their planes. And that's, that's, you know, that was actually really encouraging to see that people appreciated what we're doing. Final point on that, while we certainly did it for our customers, to me, even importantly, it was for our people. Because our people that work the flights, our people that are in the airports, didn't want to be working in a crowded airport or a crowded plane any more than when our customers wanted to sit in their planes. And we say your people first, it's easy to say, that's hard to do. We say, well, we're, gonna, we're not going to take revenue because of our people. And it turned out to be the right thing to do. So, Ed, you've got a pretty good track record, but you had one snafu in the fall. Yeah. When I told people that I was interviewing you, they were like, oh, tell Ed I'm angry at him for the loyalty program. <laughs> it's so hard to get into the top tier now. What the heck? Uh -huh. You changed the rules. Um, and you actually uh, recanted a bit. You said, uh, oops, maybe we went a little too far. 
Um, sorry, guys, we're going to roll this back a little bit, not all the way, but a little bit. So what happened in the fall with the loyalty program? Well, success does have its cost. And one of the costs of, of our success is that we have a tremendous pull for our brand. And you know, thank you all for being here. I know many people have stopped by the lounge and our various activations. And there's lines out those doors, too. So just like the clubs at Delta, there's lines here, too. So it's, uh, it goes to speak about that people want, want to be part of this experience. And um, we can't be a premium brand that has people waiting outside the door and not being able to get the seats on the planes, not being able to get the reservation service. We needed to continue to accelerate our premium supply to match our premium demand because our premium demand is going off the chart. And so we made some really hard decisions that we are going to restructure our membership tiers going forward. They still haven't taken effect largely though. They take effect in 25. And as soon as we did it, uh, made those announcements, you know, there was hue and cry. And, and anyone, any one of you that are part of that, I apologize, I'm sorry. Uh, everyone, by the way, acknowledged that we needed to do something. We couldn't operate, continue with, with lines out the door. But they always thought it should be some other way to handle it. So we made some meaningful changes to how we were doing it. And uh, we're going to continue to, to monitor it. And hopefully, you know, we're in a good spot. I've got a lot of credit back for listening and for be willing to acknowledge when we screw up. I think it's also important as a leadership trait that you know we're not perfect and we do some things and we have to listen to our customers and we have to listen to our own people. And within, within 10 days, I think I came out public and say, we're not doing that, okay? I'll tell you in a few weeks and we did and we re, you know, relaunched the, uh, the program. But it was hard, it was really hard because you know, we want everyone to love us. We want everyone to, to I, I mean, I just so appreciate it. And we're a company, by the way, that's called Sky Miles. Our membership, and no longer it was like Sky Money was was what people were, were calling. And and by the way, we we deserve that because we were resetting plans based on value, not just on on duration. And and that was one of the hard decisions we had to make. But we needed to make it in order to preserve the value for our best and and also opportunities for people to come into those programs, younger people that were working their way up the tier. And you heard a lot of those complaints firsthand in your inbox. From what I understand, you have one email address. You got one email address and one cell phone. Yeah, uh, life is really simple that way. Someone was telling me backstage that um, a customer was complaining about their armrest and emailed you, and they got a response within 24 hours from the Delta team. So how do you how do you be on the front lines for customers? You're flying coach when you can. You're responding to their emails. How do you personally show up? Well, one of the pieces of advice I received when I became CEO eight years ago was I was already too public. I needed to have a private identity. I had to have a private email. I had to have a private phone number so people couldn't find me or else I'm going to be inundated. I said, thank you very much. I'm not going to do that because I want to be accessible. I want people to feel like they can reach out and let me know how they're doing, how we're doing. I want our own employees to be able to reach me and say, I've got an issue here, what can I do to help? I got people in the community that want to reach out. And so, yes, I get thousands, thousands of, you know, Deborah's here, she can validate that. She, there's, it drives her crazy, I'm on my phone, I'm kind of, kind of sorting through stuff. But, I, but I've got a system I've developed, I've got a team around me, and I see everything that comes in, but I distribute it. I don't have to respond to everyone, but I got a team that responds to it. And you know what the value is? First of all, people are amazed. They, they, they say you actually do care. And it sets the tone, by the way, for your leadership team. Because when your boss is checking, guess what? Everyone's checking yeah. and making, making certain that you know, we're, we're, we're on top of, of what we're doing to take care of our business. The second thing is people ask me, you've got a job, you've got so many big responsibilities, how do you manage it all? I actually feel pretty calm and relaxed because I know what's happening. I generally know what's happening before people tell me because I can see it coming through my, my email chain. And so I'll, I'll know what to, to do. So there's a level of engagement that today's leader, I think, you know, has the opportunity to technology you know, can create an awful lot of bad behaviors in terms of people, you know, proliferation of, 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 of emails or texts or people's privacy, you know, not being what it, they, they might want it to be. But there's also great value in staying engaged and being part of this, this experience together. At Delta, we talk about family. We are a family. And I, I view myself as, as being responsible for that family. And I want to be there for them, whether it's 8 o'clock on a Sunday evening or 4 o'clock on a Monday afternoon. It doesn't matter to me. I'm there for them. 
So speaking of family and protecting your employees, um, you have sometimes strayed outside the traditional lines of being CEO and into uh, more social, even political issues. Um, you received a lot of feedback, <laughs> I think would be a delicate way to put it, when Georgia was changing some voting laws, you got involved, um, and you said, well, we are the largest employers of black Americans in Georgia. We have to stand up for our people. Especially as you head into an election year where we're looking at another Trump-Biden face-off, most likely, how are you thinking about where you show up as a CEO outside of the traditional lines? Well, I think corporate leaders um, need to remember their jobs are not to get engaged. On, on political matters when you can avoid it. Um, it's, you know, it's a device of time. And it, by the way, it doesn't matter almost what you say, half of the country is gonna be with you and half the country is gonna be against you. And, that, and that's shown in our political system. And, and by the way, it's not just true in the US, it's true around the world. You see a lot of divided, uh, divided polarities. Um, as a leader though, you also know, need to know what you stand for as a company, not personally, but as a company, what your brand represents, what the values, what, and who you are. People give us important responsibilities to, to carry their travel and to get them to where they need to be and connect with them. And, and today's customer, more than ever, wants to feel like they're giving their loyalty to a brand they believe in and someone that's gonna stand behind them in times of good times as well as difficult times. So sometimes you have to speak, but you can never speak without really making certain that it's, it's truly something that's in conflict with your own values as a brand. And so how I've approached it is, and, and you, you learn as you go through, and I've done this job for a long time, you know, if you're always talking about values, if you're always talking about people first, if you're always out there playing offense, not just defense, about who you are and what you represent, when those times come, people will say, okay, yeah, I get it. I understand why you said something. That's in conflict with everything they seem to, to stand for. You really get in trouble when it's a surprise, when someone feels like they're coming out just to say, to come out and say something, which comes a little bit out of the blue, or it, they, they say something, then they change it, then they say something, then they change it. And some companies get in this awful political loop that they can never seem to get out of. I'd like to think that we only speak, and we try to be very selective and very careful, when it's clearly something that's in opposition to something we strongly believe in. We say our piece and then we move on. We don't grandstand on it. We don't continue to reiterate. We make, we make our point heard. We certainly do whatever we can behind the scenes to influence change, but certainly publicly you've got to be, be cautious about it. But if you're always laying out what you're for, you can oftentimes you know, navigate through those issues and people say, I'm not surprised. You never want to surprise people. Well, your people values have shown up again and again and again through this turbulent industry that you navigate very well. Um, Ed, thank you so much for sharing your insights from the C-suite with us. And um, we hope you took value from this conversation and look forward to the next phase where you're in the interviewer seat. Yeah, Allison, uh, thank you for, you did a great job with this conversation. Thank you, let's, let's give a hand for Allison for joining me. And thank you, Allison. And I'm gonna call up to the stage Jamar Harrison, who's gonna, lead the second half of an exciting uh, conversation we're gonna have. Jamar, come on out. Good afternoon, South by Southwest. How are you doing today? Yeah. My name is Jamar Harrison, and please let me start in gratitude. I am honored to be here representing the 100,000 strong Delta family. So whether or not you're in the room or tuning into the live stream, I feel your presence. You two are on stage with Ed and I. I currently right now lead in global sales, and I'm honored to serve as president of Bold, which is Delta's black community business research group for employees. In addition, I have the great honor of hosting Gaining Altitude, which is a thought leadership series focused on having impactful and meaningful conversations on topics facing our world so that we can bring each other together in more ways than one. Now, we've had some amazing leaders join us for the past two seasons of Gaining Altitude, and I'm excited to share that today we're filming a live episode right here at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Now, yes, yes. 
Now, you just heard Ed talk about our values-led organization and how we always put people at the center of every decision we make across our organization, while also reaching our mission, which is no one better connects the world. So for today's discussion, I'd like to bring out somebody that knows a thing or two about putting people first while never settling for second best. Twice named to Time's 100 Most Influential People, today's guest is an author, an innovative culinator, and also a Emmy Award-winning TV personality uh, who's focusing on serving people across the world. He's not only known for being a pioneer in tapas here in the United States, but also known for serving people across the globe, having served hundreds of millions of people worldwide. Please help me give an Austin welcome to our guest for today, Chef Jose Andres. Hello, Ed. Hola, Jose. Eduardo. Hola. Yeah, absolutely. Please, please join me, Chef. In, in Spanish, we will call you Eduardo. My Eduardo. little brother is Eduardo. Eduardo, I like Eduardo. <laughs> Ed Welcome, brother. That's awesome. Who? How are you today? Who are your sneakers? You look, you look very comfortable. Look at my sneakers. What are those? Hey, I think we are the most sexy sneaker couple <laughs> in all of South by Southwest. Yeah, you need to put that on the Twitter I mean, feed, right? That's so cool. I love, I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Jose, thank you. You're, you're awesome uh, at what you do, and this room doesn't need any introduction to you because you, you, you are making change happen through the world. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there. You can't, you can't see them. All you see is lights. There's a bunch of people here, so that's, they're here to hear you. Uh, but you have a saying that you use in your company, and it's very much similar to what we talk about, changing the world. You talk about changing the world through the power of food and how food can change uh, lives and it can change uh, the world and connect the world. Could you speak a little bit about that? Well, <laughs> Well, uh, the power of food will be, you know, when you go to Thanksgiving and your grandma, your grandpa, your friend invites you to a great turkey, but the turkey is the driest turkey in the history <laughs> of turkeys, but still you will say how good the turkey was, <laughs> that's the power of food, <laughs> uh, that you will protect the people that love you and they are cooking that with love. Uh, well, the power of food is that everybody and everyone was at the amazing dental launch last night eating amazing barbecue, frankly. So the power of food conveys people together in powerful ways. Everybody was there at the Lenta, Delta launch last night eating amazing barbecue. But then obviously the power of food is much more than that. Uh, we need to be talking about the power of food in a very serious way. Because the power of food should be meaning of goodness, but sometimes it's bad. It's hunger in the world. It's hunger in our own cities. But it's a way to make sure that we end hunger. Uh, the power of food is bad because sometimes wars happen because food. But we have a way to make sure that those wars will not happen, where every single human on Earth will have the very simple premise that every citizen of the world should be a universal right to have access to food and water. Everybody agrees on that. It's no disagreements. That's the power of food, brings people together. The power of food is that if we eat too much of it, even if you eat healthy food, I'm an expert on that one. <laughs> Me too. You put the belly. Um, and should be the power of food that makes us healthier. Uh, the power of food is that sometimes the way we grow it will make uh, our environment worse and worse. And our waterways getting every day um, more and more uh, fertilizers and that is creating a terrible system. But the power of food with the right people doing it in the right way can change all of that overnight. So the power of food is the realization that food touches very much every single thing we are. Everybody talks about fuel, about gas. But you know what is the most important source of energy? It's the food that feeds every single human. That's the power of food. That food is the most powerful tool we have to invest in a better tomorrow. Absolutely. That's the power of food. That's, that's amazing, Chef. And you're, and you're an amazing chef, and you bring 
the world's incredible culinary treats so that we can enjoy food as well and enjoy the opportunity. But you're even more an amazing humanitarian as you've talked about this. And you launched, this over a decade ago, World Central Kitchen. This is a man that just not only says it, he puts his actions first. And I was watching TV last week, and who pops up on the news is Chef Andres uh, and the work you're doing in Gaza to bring food to the starving Palestinians and the people that are suffering around the world. Talk for a little bit about World Central Kitchen, kind of the origin of that, and the hundreds of millions of people that you've impacted through that, and then bring it real in terms of what we're experiencing a little bit here. And I know you were, you've been on the ground in Gaza. Well, uh, yeah, I've been in Gaza by, by road. I've been in Gaza by, by plane, uh, delivering uh, food airdrops. Uh, World Central Kitchen, I think some of you know, but long story short, was founded after Haiti earthquake and was out of a need I saw that, you know, when you have a fire, who do you send? The firefighters. When do you have wounded, who do you send? The doctors and the nurses. When you need to pilot a plane, who do you send? Well, the pilots don't know how to run it. When you have hungry people, who do you think will be the most prepared people to feed people? Cooks, shit. But we are never called to the conversation and we, don't, we didn't show up. So we began leaving people hungry in many situations. The Superdome, Katrina. How did we laugh? People hungry in the Superdome. You know what an arena is? It's not a sports venue. It's not a music venue. It's a gigantic restaurant that entertains with the sports and music, shit. So that's how we began, showing up, boots on the ground, and making the most we could, by helicopter or by boat, uh, opening restaurants or our own kitchens, activating uh, stadium kitchens or food trucks, use adapting every single moment. So World Central Kitchen has done, we are on our way to, to 500 million meals, done in hurricanes, in earthquakes, in volcanoes. Unfortunately, in war, Ukraine, we did 250 million meals. We are still there feeding the people, the elderly, especially near the front lines. And in the situation we see in the Middle East, first day we show up in Israel, because the people there were decimated by that terrorist brutal attack. And we began cooking in Israel with uh, Israeli chefs, taking care of the people that were brutally attacked. At the same moment, we began also cooking in Gaza, because the people are so well under bombing. And right now, uh, our main operation is inside Gaza. We have 65 kitchens, 10 more are being built, 350,000 meals a day. We've done more than 35 million uh, meals. We put inside more than 12, 1,400 uh, trucks, and we've done airdrops, and we're about to embark in the most crazy mission probably we've ever done. That's why I spent some time in Cyprus and in Israel on top of everything, because we are trying to reach the shores of Gaza by boat to make sure we can be bringing millions of meals through the beaches of Gaza, specifically to feed people in the north of Gaza that really they are hungry. We may fail, but the biggest failure will be not trying. Absolutely. That's what the men and women of Wilson Drug Kitchen are doing. That is, that is incredible, and thank you. Uh, as a citizen of the world, thank you for your heart uh, for people. Uh, you're clearly a man of values. You're clearly a man of purpose. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your business, uh, the Jose Andres Group. Uh, we've talked about this in the past. You're not quite certain what that means sometimes, uh, but what it represents is you. And so what it represents is your values and your culture that you said, and how do you get your culture and your values across an organization that's growing and living in tumultuous times? Yeah, it's funny because my company used to be called Think Food Group, and I was very happy with that name. <laughs> and everybody around me said, no, we need to call it the Jose Andres Group. And I'm like, why? <laughs> I lost the battle. <laughs> uh, and believe me, sometimes I wake up and I want to go back to call it the, the People's Group. Because when we talk about values, obviously, in companies, 
private sector, NGOs, even government. Um, I think governments sometimes forget that they are there to serve the people, not to play politics. I think we need to remember that, yes, restaurants, um, airlines, we will be in the business of taking care of our guests. But if you really think about it, we are in the business of trying the best we can to take care of your team members and your employees. That's in the value business we should all be. Um, and for me, this has been important. I have many members, many, many. Uh, we have almost 40 restaurants now. Uh, I don't open business, I tell stories, and also I open opportunities for team members that want to leave to stay with us. Uh, I have many, many members that they've been with us 30 years when they could be going anywhere else. Believe me, everybody's hiring in the restaurant business. If anybody has a resume, please give it to me, <laughs> because we need people. So we had a lot of people that they've been 30 years, and 25, and 20, a lot of them. Yep. So I don't think it's the values, our values, what keeps them, it, they are the values themselves. Exactly. It's just the gift that keeps on giving, where everybody's part of telling you the good moments, stories, but also the difficult stories. Yeah. Importantly, the difficult stories. Importantly, and, difficult and, stories. And, 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 and I think the next will be the serving your community. For, for me, it was always very important to say, in my profession, in your professions, we all have the talent. In my case, in the case of cooks, in the case of restaurants, you feed the few. But with that same talent, you can feed the many. Mm -hmm. In the pandemic, uh, my restaurants, they changed from being a restaurant in the city to community kitchens to feed the city people in need. Uh, it's not like I decide to do it. It's like everyone in the restaurants was like, okay, what are we gonna do, go home? Everybody wanted to be part yeah. of, not just running the restaurants where things were going well and we were celebrating birthdays, yeah. but taking care of the communities that, that were about to go hungry because everything was about to be shut down. Absolutely. For me, that the values within the company allow Many people volunteer. We had more volunteers than people we wanted to have in the pandemic inside the kitchens. I believe it. To try to take care of the problems one meal at a time. I learned that it's not me or the top bosses of the organization writing the list of what we are all about, what our values are, but it's the same team members that they are the ones writing the values with every one of their actions. It's, it's what your team members are doing, not necessarily what they're saying, that speaks to the culture and the purpose of your, your organization, and it's really incredible. And we share that in common, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to have Chef Jose join us today in this conversation, because our, our companies are about companies of purpose and make, making a difference. Together, we both live in the experience world. So we went through tough times through COVID and the pandemic, and people weren't able to come into your restaurants. A lot of people weren't flying, but we had to keep the airways open. You had to keep the food coming in, in alternative ways. Uh, but coming through that now, it seems like the demand set that we're both seeing is phenomenal. People want experience more than ever. That's, by the way, that's what South by Southwest is. This is an experience that we all, we all gather to, together. That's why we're drawn. Our brands are drawn, our companies are drawn to come here to experience that and be able to put our brands out there with other brands creating a difference in the world. Speak to how the experience of serving food and being in the restaurant has changed because the food is great, but it's really the experience around it. That's like my, my job. Our planes are great, though, but we don't want to talk about the planes. We want to talk about the experience while you're on the plane. Yeah, it's funny because I've been in restaurant business for four years and the more I know I'm supposed to become an expert, but I'm realizing that the more I know, the more I know I know nothing. And it's almost like every day I go even into my own restaurants like it was the first day. And I try to understand and live the experience, not like I own them or I'm the chef, but like I am one of those guests coming in. I always say I don't open business. Uh, I'm actually a very bad businessman. 
really bad. I mean, I'm technically the CEO of my company, but I'm not. I don't know why they keep me with that title. I cannot wait for the board to fire me, but they keep giving me more titles. It doesn't work. But I know a thing or two about um, the feeling, the heart, the emotional moment. That's what it is. So I never think about the restaurant in terms of what's the profits, how much we're going to sell. Luckily for me, I have great people that do that very well. But me, uh, opening a restaurant is telling a story. My restaurants tell the stories. The stories, not of me, but of the people that made many of the dishes, of the people that work with us, the young sommelier that just came, and he's telling his story through the wines he recommends, and the people behind the wines. Because it's never about the food, but it's about the people behind the food. And you know I began doing tapas. Uh, uh, some people call me the king of tapas. <laughs> Small dishes that you share. But then you learn that the experience I want people to have Sometimes it's not experience they want. And adapting to that experience where you are not imposing, but you're giving options to people to make it their own. In the case of tapas, imagine Washington, D.C., a, a city that was a lot of state places when I got there. Even we had wonderful Italians and Ethiopians. Tapas sharing in a business meeting Food that was going in the middle of the table and people never met, they had to share a plate. And people, Jose, this table don't want to share. I'm like, great. If you want to do tapas, you leave the food in the middle of the table. You don't want tapas, you move the plate 20 inches towards you. <laughs> you bring your fork and your knife. You put them around the plate because forks and knives were not created to eat people. We're created to protect your dish. <laughs> and that itself is an amazing experience. <laughs> what I thought that the business had to be the medium, that yes, you have kind of the idea of the experience you want to have, but that you have to give options to people to experience the moment in a different way. It's like, you know, hey, Ed, can I have a coffee in the wings of the plane? Uh, no, you cannot do that. <laughs> but you can bring a place, a tapa, 20 inches to you and have the experience in my restaurant uh, in a wonderful way. When I'm telling you the story of who you, of who I am, of a country, through a menu, but at the same time, I'm giving the option and opportunity to people to enjoy that experience that fits the way they want to be enjoying it. You can eat sushi with chopsticks, but I like it to eat it with my two fingers. <laughs> it's the same sushi I'm eating in the same environment. We should be giving people the options to enjoy it in a way that really they are adding their touch to the experience that I created. That becomes mar far away more powerful. So I don't have to apologize anymore for not knowing how to use chopsticks. I can use my fingers. <laughs> OK, listen to the man. That's, that's awesome. So, uh, Chef, you're also famous for saying, I'm only as good yeah. as the last meal I cooked. And at yeah. Delta, I share that. You know, while we've won a lot of awards and we've had a lot of accolades and we have a lot of fans, many fans here today, thank you for, for being here. Uh, it's really about the next flight that matters. It's always about where you're going. That's why we say keep climbing. And I know you have that same purpose about moving forward. Yeah. Speak to that. Well... <laughs> That you are only as good as the last dish you cook is no more true than in my life. You know, it's like I get the perfect review from the New York Times about Mercado Little Spain, my big Spanish homage in the heart of New York. And we get like this blowing review. And my daughter goes and tells me, you know, daddy, whatever. But the tortilla, uh, the, the Spanish potato omelet the other day was dry and not very good. <laughs> <laughs> You want to be a chef in a house with three daughters? <laughs> Man, they're, they speak their mind, uh, truthfully. So that's why I say I'm only as good as the last dish I, I cook. But I will say that I'm only as good as the people I have around me. Um, at the end of the day, I believe we are, uh, I believe in organizations that don't plan too much. 
Because when you plant too much, you know what happens? The plan can be created for, by one. I can do the plan. You can do the plan. We send it through the email. People, this is the plan. And everybody is looking around. What happened? The boss is thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> he came up with a plan. <laughs> but th what did we learn in the pandemic? What are we learning every day lately in our lives? That very often things don't go as planned. And if everybody is following the plan of one, well, it's good leaders and visionary that sometimes yeah, it may happen. But what happens if we think about putting plans away and endorse and embracing the complexities of the moment and embrace adaptation? Plans can be done by one. Each one of you can have one plan and try to push it into the world, even if nobody agrees or understands your plan. But when you embrace the complexity and you push adaptation, adaptation cannot happen if everybody in the room doesn't have a sense of ownership. Plans can be done by one. Adaptation can only happen by everybody joining. And that means that organizational charts, they need to be changing. They are way too pyramidal. Where somebody sits at the top and says, blue, and everything is blue the next day. Why? Because, because the boss said blue. And the gravity of the power of that brings that information down. Everybody is watching. Shh, what happened? The boss is thinking. Shit, what is he thinking? Blue. <laughs> Terrible. But all of the same, when you get that pyramid and you make it flat, where you are not just the boss because you sit at the top or because the title behind your door, but because you are with boots on the ground next to your teams in a more equal level playing field and where you are giving the power to everybody to adapt to the circumstances of the moment. In a restaurant, whatever happens in a table, whatever happens during the shift, when the lights go off or the gas stops coming in and we have no fire to cook, they are the plan of the one will not solve the problem of the moment. But the adaptation of the many will come up with the perfect solution to make the most out of the mayhem of the present. That's why I love adaptation, because it's about the power of the team versus plans that they are the imposition of the one. Adaptation will always win the day for me. Absolutely. That is so powerful. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we don't charge for clapping people. That is, that is so profound. You talk about the power of the table. We do the same thing. We've got 5,000 flights a day. And they don't call me to let me know what should we do when something happens, when there's weather, when there's a, a customer that needs some type of special help. Our people are empowered to make the decision, which means that they need to know that they have your trust and they, you have their back and you are always there to support them when they make those decisions in the earnest desire of providing great service. We are only as good as the people we have around us. So, and it's, you're, and, you're right. And there's, and there's so many business people that could actually continue to hear that uh, rather than those plans is actually the people that make the difference and that's the power of what we get to do together. That's why I don't call myself a chef. I don't know how to run a kitchen. <laughs> that, that's why we, they name me CEO. I, no, no, I'm serious. You know, I don't even know how to run a board. They call me Emeritus Chairman. When they give you the title Emeritus, yeah, watch it's out. like, thank you for your service, but can you move aside? <laughs> uh, do, you know, do you know how to, how to pilot a plane? You I pilot? Don't, I don't know how to fly the plane. But you're the CEO of know, your company. You know, rely on everybody. I don't know how to fix the plane. I have a hard enough time getting through an airport. And <laughs> this is the power of the team. I'm believing Precisely right. that is not bullshit, but this is a realization. It's the real deal. That you are only as good as the people the you have deal. with you. Okay, we're starting to get the queue here to wind down. So I'm going to give you a couple real quick rapid fire. Anybody fires. knows Manchester or Liverpool? What's happening? 1-1? One, one? Shit, Richard. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. Finally, your team is able to tie a game. <laughs> All right, keep going. Okay. We have two minutes. Okay, other than Austin, what's your favorite city around the world? Other than Austin. Other than Austin, of course. Austin is very awesome, but oh my God. Uh, I, I will take right now, uh, uh, we were 36 hours in Tokyo. I love Tokyo. 
Okay, it's awesome. Getting lost in the streets of Tokyo. You don't need reservations. So many amazing places. All of them are small. Oh, my God. And they don't understand your English. And they keep sending you sushi after sushi after sushi. <laughs> and they don't stop. And you are like, I surrender. I surrender. <laughs> and then they think that you want more. And they keep giving you more. <laughs> like if you are a seal in the zoo. <laughs> I love Tokyo, people. Okay, to like, Tokyo. Okay. <laughs> So it's like, I, you what, know. What's, what's your favorite dish to cook? I love to, many dishes. I don't have one, but the big pot <laughs> that will feed the world. Every, every culture has the big pot. The pot. The pot that you put things. And those things are like, eh. And then when the pot finish, the warmth of the fire, like giving birth to, to an amazing dish, sharing out of the pot. My favorite pot that will feed the wall is paella. Yeah, awesome. One day I say, I hope that every backyard in America, every Sunday or every other Sunday, will start making a paella. Now, paella. very often Sundays, I receive photos of people making paellas. Some of them, they don't look very paella-like. <laughs> But I love them for trying. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I love you for who you are and the impact you're having in our world, the impact you're having in our kitchens. And I want to thank you, Chef, for just an amazing. Now, before we sign off here, uh, we actually are going to have a little fun here for a second. OK, there are two people who have stickers on the side of their chair. And if you have one, of there's two of them in the, in the room. Look on the sides. Everyone look on the side of your chair. If you have them, you are getting free Delta One trips for you and a guest anywhere in the world we fly. With so me there's to two, Tokyo. There's two, people, there's two people sitting down. Has anybody found the stickers yet? Oh, man. This Anyone found big. the stickers yet? Everybody look. Oh, Did we find yeah. somebody? Who do we find? Let me see you. Are you taking me with you? If you found it, stand up. Let me see you. OK, we got, yay, congratulations. That's awesome. We got one other one. Is there one other one over here? Where's that, in the back? Oh, congratulations. Thank you for being loyal customers. Chef, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, It's been an amazing, amazing time. Enjoy Southwest. Thank you.